Lucy from Vienna, Austria. Welcome to Opus 15 of Classical Cake, the podcast where we discuss topics relating to Viennese classical music and Austrian culture while enjoying one of Vienna's delicious cakes. I'm your host, Daniel Adam Maltz. If you're new here, welcome. Please subscribe and be sure to visit classicalcake.com for more. My guest today is Martin Hasselbuch, founder and music director of Orchester Wiener Academia, an orchestra dedicated to playing on period instruments. He has received numerous awards and accolades for his service to Viennese music and culture, and his Orchester Wiener Academia has a discography of over 100 recordings featuring repertoire ranging from the Baroque to Romantic eras. Martin, thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure. Our cake today is Erdbeer Oberstorte, or Strawberry Cream Cake. This summery dessert features a light and fluffy strawberry cream between layers of sponge cake and buttery pastry. A layer of whipped cream is covered by a thin layer of strawberry jam on the top of the cake. So, let's dig in. Great. Thank you. The good thing is you never run out of cakes in Vienna. Delicious. The last time we saw each other was during a rehearsal on March 10th, mm -hmm. which ended up being a very unusual day in sure, Vienna. Sure. So what happened and what was your initial reaction? No, it was very emotional. We played uh, the Fate of Violin Concerto with Benjamin Schmidt, which is one of our favorite soloists. And at the interval, we got a phone call that it might be that our next concert, which was supposed to be the mm -hmm. Sunday afterwards, is in danger because the government might might uh, start a curfew, a kind of uh, a closure of the concert hall. And indeed, we played the uh, Beethoven, the Schubert, uh, C Major Symphony, very emotional for us all the time, mm -hmm. with the music fine, with students in the, in the chairs, in the audience, and afterwards, uh, the general manager came up and told us there will be no concert. Yeah. And this is like, a train in full speed, <laughs> crashing into a wall. It was very emotional and everybody almost cried. We had the additional problem that we were supposed to uh, do a photo shooting of the orchestra mm -hmm. and of myself. So we had to smile and we had to cheer up, but all the thoughts were very sad. Yeah. And <clears throat> this was the first of, so far, I would say 52 concerts which were cancelled, because this would have been our main time of touring and of um, concertizing after our recordings of the symphonies and the piano concertos. So this would have been, we would call it our, our harvest of, yeah. the, of the recording period. So, but that's life. Yeah, right now mm -hmm. we're in the middle of a different mm -hmm. situation. So we'll come back to how musicians have been impacted by coronavirus crisis in a bit, but something I noticed is that in this rehearsal was also being observed by a school group. Is yes. this normal as well? This is very normal. I remember when I was a school child, I went to the concerts there. Um, it's, it, this has changed very much because we were just allowed to sit in, to be silent. And right now it's a, it's a process of talking to the audience and talking to the young students and for many of them, it's not just the music which is new, it's this music verein, which is kind of a, like a castle in the middle of Vienna. <laughs> There's a, kind of a limit for some people to enter the hall. And it's in the interest of, of us and of the concert hall and of the schools that these young kids see, the, see a concert, have the occasion to go there. This is the audience of tomorrow. So why did you start Orchestra Wiener Academy? Yeah, and it's connected with the Musikverein. I'm, I'm an organist and I, I started very early with organ concerts and in 85 there was the big uh, Bach anniversary. So everybody played Bach, I played the complete organ works and uh, we had a concert series connected with the Musikverein and then the main librarian, Dr. Bieber, came up and said we have this congress here uh, would you be interested in playing with some of your friends, some harpsichord concertos in the B minor suite? And said, why not? And we just met together. If you're an organist in Vienna, you always play with orchestra, you always conduct, because all the church music in the churches is the Vienna style classical church mm -hmm. music is with instruments and chorus. Yeah? And so I just called some of my friends and 
This was a lot of fun, and then we got another invitation. The group was called in the beginning Vienna Bach Consort. And then uh, we decided, okay, either we do it on a professional level or we do it uh, just as a hobby. Sure. And so we decided for the professional level, then the um, repertoire got bigger. We said, okay, concert and Bach is not our only goal. And this was the time of the foundings of uh, with the next generation of the Academy of Ancient Music, Academy of St. Martin the Fields. Mm -hmm. And for us it was the idea, okay, why not call the Orchestra Vienna Academy, yeah? Which was a nice idea, sometimes it was a problem because in some Eastern European countries, academies are schools. Mm -hmm. yeah, so everybody thought in the beginning, many people thought, oh, this is a school orchestra. Mm -hmm. So that's what we are not. But <laughs> since then, this was um, a very quick start with the orchestra and a very fast beginning. We were lucky because we always had the chance to play in this most beautiful halls here yeah. and in the beginning to travel a lot because uh, we were, this was new, we were the first generation after Hanukkah. Right, I was going to say this is, you know, the mid 80s, this is yeah. still very early onset of this sort sure. of early music yeah, yeah. movement, so there must have been a lot of excitement around this. There was excitement, there were not many players. I remember at the beginning we had to get some of the wind players from Holland, the trumpets came from England, so we had, it was kind of a, at the same time we were traveling a lot and uh, still we were not the very first pioneer generation, but we were very early and I remember we, for instance, we were the very first orchestra to play the Mozart da Ponte opera, some period instruments in on the continent, in Europe, yeah, yeah wow. in modern times. And mm -hmm. so you have a lot of premier possibilities. And, yeah. and connected with the orchestra came a time where we started to discover a lot of unplayed music. I was at the same time organist of the Court Chapel in Vienna. Court Chapel where they had this huge library of dating back to the 1400s. Mm -hmm. and um, we discovered a lot of music from this library, so it was a mixture of discovery and um, kind of playing the normal repertoire in a, in a new style. So how would you describe historical performance practice or historically informed performance? Yeah, it's a mixture of uh, research and practical life. I think uh, the balance is not always easy to keep because uh, you have to study, you have to read, at the same time you have to be careful that your own inspiration, your own personal style doesn't disappear behind the books, I would say. Yeah? Yeah. So, the problem is to, to have your personal style, your personal narration, I would say, but based on enough scientific and historic evidence, uh, we have to, to put our own interpretation in a, in a scheme, in a level where some things, extremes are wrong, mm -hmm. and if you don't look for the extremes, you're boring because it's flat. Mm -hmm. yeah? so, Something in between means interpretation for me. Yeah. One of the most interesting aspects of the Orchestra Vienna Academy today is the ReSound concert series. So, what is your goal with this? The ReSound is if you if you go for the philosophy, uh, we have this right now in Corona. We have this time where the, we are not able to perform in real life, mm -hmm. and uh, so there were some theory guys who said, "Oh." real life culture is over, everything is streaming and it's just education if it's Mona Lisa in the real painting or Mona Lisa on our screen. Mm -hmm. yeah. For sure this is totally wrong. <laughs> and it's based on the work of Walter Benjamin, the, the art work in the time of, um, how is it called in, in English, of multiplication I would say. Yeah. So um, we 
look for the real thing, and the real thing is not just knowledge, it's not just interpretation, it's something what we could call the aura, uh, the erratic, uh, auratic um, surrounding of the art object. So mm -hmm. if you go to a museum and you see the Mona Lisa hanging on this place, or you see this famous painting there, then you get a shiver, and it's more than just seeing it and describing it. And the same with music. Um, as an organist, I had the occasion sometimes to play instruments while you knew on these keys Bach had his fingers. Mm -hmm. And this is extremely touching. This is unbelievable. And there's a strong emotional thing. And the advantage in Vienna is you live in a city where if you keep your eyes open and if you know the history, you can connect every single house, every single corner to some event, to some musical event. Yeah? And you have a subtext. You walk to the streets with all the tourists, and, but you can say on this corner Franz Schubert had a snowball fight with his <laughs> uh, schoolmates and so on. And uh, being in the court chapel, there's the manuscript of a mask where Schubert scribbled he uh, created a crowd for the last time uh, right, because he has, his voice was breaking as a boy. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And for me, this is the, the basic idea of result. You live in Vienna, you have the occasion to go to the original places. You can hear the music at the place where it was performed. You can stand at the same place where Beethoven conducted his stuff. Yeah? And this is the emotional side. And there's a scientific side. If you know how many violins played in this hall, if you know how the acoustic is, if you have the same instruments which Beethoven used at this time, you can say that you get quite a similar sound mm -hmm. which Beethoven must have heard when he conducted the pieces himself. And this is something fascinating. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You get more information than somebody who just sits with a modern fiddle in a, in a modern hall. One of the main impressions was that this uh, big orchestra in the small halls feels so strong that you feel it under your skin, yeah. the, the physical sound of music. That's also the heart of the reason why I came to Vienna. Um, yeah. My area of study and my interest in, in Vienna classic, Viennese classicism, mm -hmm. yeah, I knew that there was something to be gained by walking the streets, even yeah. something to be an aesthetic or an ethos to be just to pick up on just yeah. because of the geographical <coughs> location of Vienna. And it's, it's with your knowledge, you, you experience the city in a different way than yeah. just somebody who, would, we have many students here who come here to, to, to go to a teacher, go to the lessons, but they don't use the, the many possibilities which are around them. Yeah. Yeah? And for sure I tell my, my students, first thing, go to the opera, go to the music friend, go to the horse. Yeah. And uh, for sure this is part of musical life. Uh, yeah. Are there any special considerations that you keep in mind, specifically because you work with period instruments? Um, I work a lot with modern orchestras too, and for sure you have a sound in your ear. Yeah, you know, you can achieve a sound. There are always some very characteristic examples, for instance, in the Mozart slow movements or well, operas. You have always this balance a flute, then the first violins, and bassoon mm -hmm. in octaves, which is one beautiful sound on period instruments because it melts uh, automatically. Yeah. With modern instrument, it doesn't melt automatically, but you have to sound in your ear, and then you tell your flute player, please <laughs> play a little bit darker in your <coughs> color, and you tell the violins you have to dominate the sound a little bit more, so you learn a lot, mm -hmm. which you can use for modern instruments. Why should today's musicians be exposed to these period instruments? In the normal orchestras right now, it's in Europe, if you're a trumpet player and you apply for a job, you have also to be able to play baroque trumpet. The same with horn. Yeah? Mm -hmm. For the woodwinds, it's 
difficult. Clarinets can switch, oboes cannot switch, so it's a, it's a different study. But I would recommend, I would tell any young player, try to get both, mm -hmm. yeah? historic and modern. Concerts and other large-scale events have been cancelled for the foreseeable future for yeah. a while. How has this affected you, your orchestra, and the individual musicians themselves? Yeah, I have these two groups. Uh, Vienna is my main subject, but I always have a small group in, in uh, Los Angeles where I'm music director, Musica Angelica. And in the beginning, I thought both situations are uh, very different because in in uh, Europe artists have some protection. Yeah, mm -hmm. so in the beginning, for sure, the first concert which was um, not played was paid by the organizer because we were still before the new law, which said uh, that this is uh, force majeure. Mm -hmm. It's, it's um, fate that Corona came. Um, afterwards, I had major problems and. It cost us a lot of time to secure the basic needs for the musicians because in period instrument orchestras the musicians are freelance musicians. Yeah. They are not employed by the state like the Vienna Phil or the, like by the city like the Vienna Symphony. So the state provided in the beginning some assistance and so the musicians got some assistance but right now the situation is getting more complicated because we don't know when it's when this is going to end yeah so i was working on several on several um, levels i tried when a concert was cancelled i tried to get immediately a replacement date for the next season and so on uh, but we all don't know how the future will be. So, but we are all in the same boat and uh, we have to be a little bit loud to be heard that the government and the sponsors, we don't know the possible sponsors because all the economy is going down. On the other side, I, I get the feeling that people are kind of longing for new concepts. And mm -hmm. We are trying to adapt as much as we can to the new situation and there are strict laws right now for protection and for distancing. And I told the concert organizers, we are a baroque orchestra, we can stand, we can mm -hmm. play with a bigger distance between the players. So I hope that this will be a new start and then the rules will get a little bit less strict. Mm -hmm. and for sure, we all hope for the medication which allows that people can go to the concert without fear. Mm -hmm. Because the right situation right now, both sides, for players and audience, fear is the, the worst enemy of any arts, of free arts. So mm -hmm. if people are afraid, people who are afraid cannot listen and cannot play. It's just, I hope this can be resolved soon. Yeah. Sure. And that was only a taste of what Orchestra Wiener Academia can do. Check out their Resound concert series and their newly released complete Beethoven orchestral works, including the symphonies and concertos of Gottlieb Wallisch. Visit wieneracademia.at, W-I-E-N-E-R-A-K-A-D-E-M-I-E dot A-T. Thanks, Martin, for sharing this classical cake with me. Thank you. What's a pleasure. And thanks to you listeners for tuning in. If you haven't already, please subscribe, like, and share. I'm Daniel Adam Maltz. See you in Vienna. Auf Wiedersehen.